excited to be here at East West because I have been to so many uh, great book talks and workshops here by some of my favorite authors. And I always like to pay a little bit of tribute to my own teachers and, and the authors who inspired me. So I thought I would mention two amazing writers and teachers who uh, I've seen here in this room. Natalie Goldberg, now I only have a couple copies of her books here. Um, this is one of them, Wild Mind. But she writes about the intersection of Zen Buddhism, mindfulness practice, and writing. Fabulous uh, writer and teacher. And Sherry Huber, who is a local Zen teacher. Um, and this book is called What You Practice is What You Have. But all of her books are fantastic offerings of wisdom and humor and compassion. And uh, they have a whole shelf of her stuff right outside, if you guys are interested in that. And I was thinking about how talks like this can sometimes be a little bit of a spark. Sometimes we hear something that we really need to hear. Maybe we already know is true but need to be reminded of. Or maybe that uh, plants the seed for something that we hope is true but haven't yet fully given our faith and trust to. And it made me think about one such talk with Sherry Huber uh, that I was at maybe 12 or 13 years ago, where she was encouraging us to think about approaching the things that we want in life, not from anxiety and fear, and not from self-criticism and shame, but from some other place that as she described it, I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about, because I was used to doing it out of fear and anxiety and self-criticism. And I remember hearing her describe this perfectly lovely approach to life that might involve self-compassion, uh, and a kind of uh, vision for yourself as opposed to self-criticism. And I remember thinking, that sounds really good for other people. Maybe somebody else is going to be allowed to, to pursue their life this way. But I need the anxiety. Otherwise, I'd never do anything. Uh, that's, I'm, you know, I'd be on a couch all day. Um, I, maybe self-compassion, self-acceptance is good for those other folks, but let me just fix myself first, and then I'll embrace the whole self-compassion idea. And um, what I've discovered since then, uh, both from continued studies of these wisdom traditions and also excitingly from the science, uh, is that actually the things we think are holding us together, like anxiety or self-criticism, are usually the things that are actually holding us back. And although I needed that seed planted uh, back in the day, um, I I've come to realize that whatever angle you look at it from, from the wisdom traditions like Buddhism and yoga, or from the latest in neuroscience and medicine, that this seems to be the truth. That when we approach what we want from a place of compassion and mindfulness, uh, we're not only more likely to get what we want, but it's a radically different experience of life. And uh, so what I'm here to talk to you about today is actually the thing we didn't hear about in the introduction, this uh, new audio course called The Neuroscience of Change, which is actually a brand new class. The, um, the Willpower Instinct book that was mentioned, that was based on a class I teach at Stanford called The Science of Willpower, that some of you guys have taken. Um, and this is actually, this was, uh, this was because I wanted permission to bring in the wisdom side. You know, in the science of willpower and the willpower instinct, I get to talk about the brain, I get to talk about the psychology, um, but there wasn't quite as much room to talk about how important deep practice is to support these things and what self-compassion is really like, not just the evidence that it works, but, but how do you cultivate self-compassion when maybe you know, every cell in your brain seems to be hardwired for self-criticism or anxiety or self-doubt uh, or anger? And so what I'm going to do today is talk you through, <laughs> I'm getting the hand signals, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about sort of key principles for a compassion and mindfulness-based approach to change and, and approach towards pursuing any sort of goals. Okay, so I want to start with the uh, first principle of change uh, that actually we, spend, we need to spend the least time on because it is so patently true that as soon as you start to pay attention to it, you know it's true. That change is already happening. And many times in life, we, are, we have a relationship to change that doesn't seem to really reflect this truth. We may feel completely and totally stuck, and we don't see any path towards getting out of the hole that we're stuck in. Uh, or we may feel like we can hold on to what we have, that we can cling to life the way it is, and somehow prevent change so that we don't lose what we really, we really want to hold on to, whether it's a relationship or a job or our health or physical capacity. Uh, and so we have this weird relationship to change where we both feel completely and utterly desperate to change things we think can't be changed, and yet we also feel 
like we cannot stand the change that is already unfolding. And what the wisdom traditions teach us is that these are the two main sources of suffering in life, both uh, failing to see that change is already unfolding uh, and not clinging, and then at the same time, not believing that we cannot possibly be happy with things the way that they are, and we need them to change in a very specific way before we can have any experience of peace or happiness. Um, and we can even just check this out now, the uh, sort of different way of accepting change and guiding change by checking in with your breath. So let's do a little practice now, which is really the foundation for any practice of mindfulness or of self-compassion, which is turning into your breath the thing that reveals almost everything you need to know about change. So go to make yourself just maybe 1% more comfortable than you are right now. And put your hand, one or both hands, somewhere on your body where you can feel the movement of the breath. Maybe the belly, maybe the chest. And feel free to either close your eyes or drop your gaze. I will not be doing anything visually interesting for the next couple of moments. <laughs> okay, so notice that the breath is already happening. And you can be a witness to it. As you breathe in and as you breathe out, this process of change is unfolding. Okay, now, if you would like, I invite you to hold your breath. Either hold it in, try to hold on to it, or exhale and hold it out and try to resist the incoming breath for however long you can sustain without passing out because you didn't sign liability waivers. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so maybe you're holding the breath right now and noticing what that feels like, resisting the in-breath, resisting the out-breath. Go ahead and breathe. <laughs> breathe if you're still holding the breath. Notice what that felt like. And now I encourage you to let's maybe speed up this process a little bit. I want you to try taking as big of a breath as you can, as fast as you can. <sighs> breathe out, breathe out, breathe out. Push it out, get it out. Now do it again. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. More, more, more. Push it out, get rid of it. Okay, stop. <laughs> if we did that long enough, you would probably be pretty cranky and uncomfortable or panicked or overwhelmed pretty soon. Now, let's erase what we just did, the breath holding and the crazy breathing. Go ahead and just breathe. Just breathe. Turn your attention back to your breath. Noticing how it feels to breathe in and how it feels to breathe out. And allow yourself to become more of a willing participant in this process that is already unfolding. You might set the intention to allow the breath maybe to deepen or smooth out without struggling to control the breath. Invite the breath to settle And notice how this is maybe a little bit more enjoyable way of relating to the breath. Okay, if you have your eyes closed, go ahead and open your eyes. Maybe move your head and neck around a little bit, partly to check to see if someone is sleeping next to you and elbow them. It's time to wake back up. That, we actually need to do that in my undergraduate lectures whenever we close our eyes to breathe. <laughs> but you guys look very alert. Okay, so that even just a very basic practice of observing the breath is uh, a foundation for mindfulness and self-compassion. Um, and hopefully you had that kind of direct experience that when you attend to something, uh, the just attending can actually improve the experience, that there's really nothing that is not improved by paying full attention to it. And that's the second principle of, uh, of change and of compassionate change or mindful change. And that is to accept whatever it is you think you want to change, whatever it is that you think you need to change. And in fact, this is very much the opposite of what most of us do, especially if it's an inner experience that we think we need to change. The, oh, there's no problem. We're good. This is East-West. We have to take a very spiritual attitude towards technological problems, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Um, especially when it comes to inner experiences we think we might need to change. Here's just an array of inner experiences you might have had in your life, hurt, abandonment, guilt, anger, fear, resentment, inadequacy, mistrust, confusion. Has anyone had any of those ever? Oh, thank you for raising your hand, excellent. If I had any door prizes left, you would get one. Um, okay, so many of us think before we are able to change our lives or change our behavior, we need to change this stuff first. Before I can do the thing that I'm afraid of, I need to fix this anxiety. I cannot stand these feelings of fear and anxiety, so I have to fix that. I've got to change that before I can take action. Uh, or maybe I'll stop criticizing you know, my spouse or my kids when I stop feeling so irritated that they keep doing everything wrong. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll stop smoking or I'll stop eating donuts three times a day when I stop wanting them. When the cravings are gone, that's when I'll be able to stop drinking or smoking or eating or whatever the, the harmful habit is. Um, and maybe I'll take that first step in the thing I really want to do when I'm no longer feeling uh, like I'm unsure about what the outcome will be, whether I'm unsure that I'm adequate to this challenge. And so many of us go about our lives trying to fix those inner experiences so that we can shore ourselves up for something outward to change uh, or for our actions to change. And what we, we learn from both the science and the wisdom traditions is that actually the only way to transform experiences like that, whether they're cravings or guilt or anger or fear, is actually by fully embracing them and not only accepting that they happen and that you can't control the inner experience, but actually getting very curious about them and turning your full attention to them. This is something I had heard my meditation teachers say for years and years and years. Uh, and only recently has the science started to pick up and investigate this question. And so I wanted to share with you two of my favorite um, neuroscience studies looking at how profound accepting the very thing you are begging and hoping will change, will go away, how that acceptance, that mindful acceptance, is the thing that actually helps transform it, rather than rejecting it or trying to get rid of it. Okay, now I realize not everyone in this room is used to looking at um, brain imaging pictures and listening to brain studies, so I'm going to walk you through the few brain studies we talk about today. First of all, has anyone been in one of these? Very fun. Not fun, right? Actually not fun. So this is a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine where you put your head in that, and the re researchers get to look at what's happening in your brain and they can track changes in blood flow in your brain to find out what areas of your brain are more active, are using more energy. And in this particular study, uh, they brought smokers who were interested in quitting but had not yet succeeded at quitting, brought them into the laboratory, put them in one of these brain scanners so they could see what was happening in the brain, and then they started to show them images related to smoking, like somebody smoking or a cigarette or a pack of cigarettes. And for some of those images, which, by the way, we know triggers cravings, uh, if, you, if you have any sort of addiction and you see something related to it, most people will experience an immediate craving and a need to indulge. So they knew that's what they were going to be doing to the smokers. Uh, for some of the images, they were instructed to just view the image and you know, do nothing atypical. Just whatever was happening was going to happen. And for some of the pictures, they were told to practice mindful attention to what was happening. And if they felt a craving for the cigarette, to actually get very curious about what that craving felt like, to notice what it felt like in their body, to notice what thoughts were coming up, like, oh my god, I could really use a cigarette right now. Uh, and to actually look right at that experience of wanting, and not to distract themselves visually either from the picture. Don't close your eyes. Go ahead and look at the image and notice how you feel when you see it. Okay, so for some images, they were just doing what we typically do in life, and in some, they were practicing mindfulness of both the trigger and the craving. And here's what they found. Okay, so first of all, here's how to look at pictures of, uh, from brain imaging studies. The first thing you might want to know is what the hell is this? So imagine that I'm standing this way, and you're going to cut my head in half. You're going to go right through my nose and forehead and take this right side of the head off like you're opening a book so you can see into the middle of my brain. This is like the midsection of the brain. And what you're looking at here are composite images of all of those smokers in the study. So you smush everyone's brains in together to get one composite picture. And you're looking at areas of the brain here that become more or less activated depending on whether the smokers were practicing mindfulness or not. 
And the main finding uh, in this study was that when smokers uh, tended mindfully to their cravings and to the trigger, the activation in what's known as the craving or the, the addiction system of the brain became less activated. The more they paid attention to what the craving felt like, the less activated the craving centers were in the brain. There was something about paying mindful attention that started to actually turn the whole process of wanting and needing off. It's the exact opposite of what many people think. Many of us think if we look directly at what we're experiencing it, we're gonna drown in it. As, as wisdom traditions say, when you look right at something, it starts to dissolve. The solidness of it starts to dissolve.